So one of the things that <clears throat> you will find uh, very sobering, kind of a reality check, what's in the news this morning? Anyone? What's the main headline in the news this morning? I sadly don't watch the news, so I'm not sure. We'll open a browser and go to news. What are you going to see? What's the headline? I'll wait. I'm seeing the hurricane. Thank you. Thank you. There is a hurricane. There is a, a surge, right? So they're going to be talking about a storm surge with feet of water. And... Um, Our topic uh, that we took up at the end of last week and voted as a class had to do with this interest, right? So if we, let's just minimize, well, we have eight, wait a minute. <clears throat> we have eight people in now. So I'm gonna go ahead and update this. And uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, Offer a warm welcome to uh, UVI iPad, who has joined our Zoom session. Um, I know that sounds crazy. <laughs> but this is about network forensics and unexpected or uninvited guests is kind of a kind of part of the theme here. So uh, in your participants list, if you're looking, I have I have a, a Kindle uh, display I'm going to share with you. Oh. Top of the news this morning is the hurricane. Uh, thank you for offering. Was that Chimera or Shanoa that said that about the hurricane? Chimera. Yeah. Thank you for calling that out. As we closed last week, we were um, in agreement that availability was the stepchild or the afterthought in most discussions that concern the CIA essentials of cybersecurity. So everybody's caught up at the confidentiality and integrity part, but it's the availability piece that uh, creates the most havoc. If the hurricane were headed in our direction, we would have much uh, a greater heightened awareness of availability issues. Um, but the simple truth is in a network environment, as we all know so well, um, network availability and stability and integrity in our territory has, has faced challenges, right, in recent years. And so what we've done is uh, revised based on a unanimous decision in the class, right? So everybody voted and as we looked at all of the responses, the confidential responses, what we found is that all of you said, yeah, availability, we should do hands-on stuff for availability. And um, what we've done is posted a few related assignments. You, you knew about the um, textbook assignment and we extended the deadline. If you have not yet submitted, you can submit late, but I will be grading those later today. Um, we need you to submit your Microsoft server license activation codes and, and then uh, your take on the flipper, host capacity. We'll talk about those in just a moment. Does anyone have any questions about the server license activation or is that pretty self-explanatory? Would anyone like to see the specifics on that? So you're going to navigate to the My Campus portal and Microsoft Software Downloads. We need you to upload the text file itself 
If you don't have the latest copy of the 2022 server ISO, you might want to download that so that you have a local copy. We're going to be using both the standard and the data center editions in this course. Um, we will ask you to contribute your data center license because unless you have data center hardware, it's not going to come in handy very much, but we are going to ask you to use a standard license to build a virtual machine later in the course. Um, we need both activation keys. And so, and we need that in a text file and you need to label each. And here's something I want to cue you into. I will be using this to stage some of the virtual machines on our virtual system platform, the data center edition at least. So you, you do want to take some time and make sure you get the right one. Don't get the 2019 uh, version and so on. Um, that was due on Monday. You still have time to submit that if you haven't completed that yet. The Any questions on the flipper? What do people think about the flipper and would anyone offer comments on this topic? I just... Anything come to mind you'd like to share with the class? Uh, for me, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I think it's a really cool device. It's just a little scary at the same time that with how much things it can do um, and how much privacy it can invade. Yes, I I agree with that. Uh, Cool, but scary, yeah. Jadel? Uh, I was going to say pretty much the same, but um, I it's interesting because, um, for one, something that caught me off guard was the fact that it can, although it can't, like, you know, replicate things like a bank card, a debit, credit, you know, things like that. It can, however replicate the signals for hotel keys yes. so like if you go into like a hotel or even some place like um they call it lime tree you could possibly like match like the cards for those and be able to access i i thought i had shared in a previous session my son had one of these this summer he was a pulp bearer at my mother's funeral but while we were in the hotel my key wasn't working and he he cloned the key so he did the very thing you're talking about, and he demonstrated live that it works. So he owns one of these. Um, if you're interested, I'd like to ask him to give it to us uh, for a short time so we can kind of noodle with it. I'll bring it over onto the St. Thomas campus so any of you over on St. Thomas can, can uh, have a look. Uh, thank you for sharing. Any others? Any other comments? Yeah, so I actually learned about the device like a few months ago. Um, but from what I know about it is like it can do a wide range of things and that's like its strong suit. Like, but individually a lot of the capabilities of it can be achieved with like other devices, like the NFC capabilities could be done with like an Android phone. Yes. Yes. And the RFID stuff could also be done. Um be replicated with other devices as well. So it's strong suit is like it has everything in one. Right. Right. Very versatile. So it's kind of kind of like a Swiss Army knife for hacking, really. If if you would, you know, if you want to borrow an analogy. Um, I'd like to talk about this. This should be familiar for everyone. Uh, it's not the first time that you've done this assignment, but in order for us to optimize the availability of your home networks, uh, we have to make sure that we don't have host side artifacts. That's actually a full chapter uh, in your textbook. You'll see uh, a topic for one of the upcoming chapters, host side artifacts, right? What we don't want is for you to draw conclusions about your home network. And what we have is uh, a behavior or an issue that's manifesting, but it's it's a condition of, of your host machine. 
So in the process of assessing your host capacity and optimizing your technology, you're also downloading the latest updates, which in theory, you know, the latest version of Windows 10 or Windows 11 should should be stable. It should it should uh, have integrity compared to previous versions that have been exposed and partially patched along the way. Um, I would like to ask if there are any of you that have started this process. It's me when I thought you had a girlfriend. I'm sorry, was there a question? No, I was going to say um, I started the process. I'm turning it in already. Yeah, the, the due date was 9 a.m. this morning, but I'm going to modify that and give you till the start of class on Friday to submit. If there's anyone who has uh, started the process and met with challenges or issues, uh, I'd like you to stay in the session after we close out today. Uh, when we end our class, just sit tight. And uh, before you clear the session, I want you to post something in chat and, and say you'd like to show or share something. Um, there may be some quick workarounds or it, depending on your situation, what I'd like to do is assess your, your challenges uh, as a team together, right? Student and instructor, and, and then make some informed decisions about either how to adapt the preparation or to simply choose an alternative, right? So you qualify the challenges appropriately and that's what you submit. And then you say instructor and student decided together to implement plan B, right? A virtual system, right? So that's, that's up to you. If you can, you should complete this activity regardless of whether you run virtual machines on your system or not. But uh, what we're finding is that uh, as students progress through their uh, seasons with each academic year, their technology is getting older and older. Unless you've recently purchased a new system, you may be at a place where you're starting to hit the brick wall. Now, this last uh, solution, uh, we're going to talk more in depth on Friday. And this is the Friday before our Labor Day weekend, so it's going to be a long holiday weekend. But we want to explain that there is a there is another part of this assignment. So the first two tasks, uh, you may have been in a class previously where you did similar things, but that's so that we can gather uh, information about your local machine. And then task three, uh, task three will come as a part of extra credit. So what am I saying? Uh, you will receive five points of credit for completing each of the following tasks. And task one and task two Task one has two subtasks, 1A and 1B. Task two has three subtasks, each worth one point. But we did, the goal isn't to stop there. The goal is to bank additional credit and then make changes on your home network with that information to improve your situation. I mentioned here the microwave test. So this is actually pretty cool. And I'm gonna, this is a teaser. This is a teaser for what we will demonstrate in class on Friday. Now we're gonna be in the classroom on Friday and Fridays are gonna be hands-on workshop days, right? I'm gonna bring a microwave, <laughs> an old microwave into the classroom and I'm gonna show, so, so the goal of our, our solution is to collect appropriate and related information, but then the intent is not to leave it there, but to do something to improve the availability of your network in your home environment. And if the only thing you do is to see whether or not there are other things that are interfering with your Wi-Fi signal, 
right? The simple microwave test would be a really cool thing. So what you do is you pick up uh, an app on a tablet or a smartphone that measures the strength of Wi-Fi signals. Has anyone ever seen something like this? Yes. Yeah, it's very, very cool stuff. There's a neat graph, it's real time. It tells you how big the signal is and what, what uh, frequency it's on and which SSIDs are viewing, right? What we wanna do is uh, capture that screen while it's analyzing your signal without the microwave running three feet away. And then we wanna turn the microwave on for a minute to heat a cup of water and repeat the test to see if there's any deviation. If you see any decrease in the strength, what does that tell you? Anyone? That um, the frequency of one is on the same wavelength, thus disrupting it. Yes, that's correct. Microwaves use 2.4 gigahertz, just like your uh, Wi-Fi. And unless you're using 5G Wi-Fi exclusively, uh, most devices are connecting across 2.1, 2.4 gigahertz, right? So this is something worth knowing for your health. How about the availability of your liver? If you're standing in front of a microwave waiting on your reheat for two minutes and it's radiating microwave around the case, you wanna to stand too close to that or not? Or maybe you wanna replace it or not? So the availability issues <laughs> extends, <laughs> extends further than just the digital realm. It extends into the biological realm, right? Some conditions that affect availability on a network can also affect other dynamics that will impair or impede your efficient access to digital resources. I mean, if you're down for the count because you have cancer now and it's liver cancer, I'm just, you know, that's, that's a bit of a stretch given, uh, you know, it's a bit of a stretch, but just thought I'd, I kind of extend that thought a little further. So please be present on Friday, bring your tech and uh, be ready to do hands-on stuff in class because what we'll do is walk through each of these steps and then offer some options for what you can do once you discover uh, specific results, okay? Any questions at this point about the 1.5 solution? Again, we'll cover more in depth on Friday. Okay, what I'd like to do now is share a screen and begin our review of the module one content. And so for our primary topics, network essentials for home, small practice and enter enterprise environment, common challenges and practical fixes on private and public networks. That's how we are framing this module based on the decision, the unanimous decision on Friday. So we wanna explain network protocols and how they work, extrapolate further for a client server context. Now this part is not in the textbook. This part may or may not be in the textbook. See, when this textbook was written, IPv6 was not as commonplace or as, um, so you may encounter IPv6 networks now. So what we wanna do is make sure that we uh, extend the concepts that the author provide in the IPv4 context. I just want to call that out to you so that you're aware. Uh, some of these learning outcomes are uh, related to our mutual decision as a class and not directly for the content in the textbook, right? Um, I am excited to see what our author is going to share in chapter two. We're going to view that on the screen. That's the reading assignment, right? So if you haven't read Chapter two, from start to finish, you're gonna to wanna to do that. But we're gonna kind of fish around uh, in some of the, in some of the, with some of the concepts. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my sharing. And then our guest, the iPad is going to share the screen. And I'm hoping that that's not gonna 
disrupt everything or screw it all up because uh, that's what I'm, everybody see the screen? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay. And then right here. Let's go this way. Well, that's better. So he's um he's taking the time to share a scenario. It starts with sitting at his desk at his desk. He was looking for his next target. So he's he's uh, giving you the perspective of a network uh, an adversary, right? A malicious adversary on a live network. And if you took the time to read this carefully, there are a couple of things that should jump out and bite you on the nose. And they should relate to previous classes that we've had. What I'd like you to do at this point, since this is a 400 level class, and many of you are about to graduate, what I'd like you to do is read that first paragraph. And then, well, down to the bottom of the screen. And then I'm gonna ask you, okay, what are some things that become apparent what are some issues that that speak to you in this passage so i'm going to halt for a second actually a minute i'll time you everybody start reading and then uh i'll ask and then we'll share ideas here go Okay, it's about, about a minute. Does anybody need more time? All righty. I'd ask a volunteer. Uh, can someone share what are some of the things that are obvious interests in this scenario? Where is this person? He's on like the job site location or like at his work desk. Yeah, that's what you can infer. He's sitting at his desk. So he's not he's not in his car scanning Wi-Fi. He's not war driving, right? Okay. He's looking for his next target. What does that imply? About that implies that this isn't his first. That's it's not right. his first rodeo. That's right. It's not his first rodeo. Let's keep going. So what is he doing next? Is he using hacking tools or just everyday, ordinary? No, my boy's just doing normal Google searches and like Facebook scrolling. Yeah, he's doing competitive research. The term for what he's doing is called competitive research. When you're pen testing, what you're doing is checking to see things about the company, where the job sites are, then you can begin to dig a little deeper. If you know where the location is, you can find out, okay, who are the service providers in the area? And then you can find out important contacts, important information, right? If you get the names of some key people and you're scanning on a network, you can start to know who and what you're going to do. Let's take the next sentence. He was in need of addresses and what? A 
Is it just addresses? Is it just IP addresses? Host names. Host names. Named resources. And he knew of several places he'd be able to locate that information with just a few commands in his what? Open terminal. Open terminal. So, so let's put this into context. Where is he now? At the office. At his desk. It's not his first rodeo. What kind of screen is he on? A terminal. Is it a command prompt? Is no, it a PowerShell a... window? What does the word terminal imply about the software he's using? Easy to run. Oh, it's six. Mm -hmm. He's on, he could be on an OS X machine. That's an astute observation because you do have terminal capabilities. You have Linux capabilities on a Mac. So he could be a power user in the Mac realm. But let's say that he's skilled and he's this isn't his first rodeo. What's also a likely possibility? What else could he be using? A Say again. Virtual a virtual machine. machine and a VPN. A virtual machine. Yeah, with with any and every with all of the possible uh, tools and resources, right? To include VPN connections, to include uh, terminal windows, to include a Kali, right? He could be using Kali, or he could he could be using other hacker tools, or just plain Linux, right? Okay, so that gave him a starting point with just a few commands and an open terminal window. That means he he's either a terminally, he, he is a Mac user that's into the terminal, which means he's not your garden variety Mac user. Those are hints that are useful because you want to understand your adversary, right? So with just a few commands, now he has a number of network addresses that he can start poking at. That gave him a starting point and a few what? A few what queries? Named resources goes hand in hand with what service? What are the initials you see on the screen? It's not a trick question. Everyone in unison, D N S. S. Yeah, right? DNS. DNS is like a linchpin. It is an Achilles heel, but it's a there's a there's a significant dependency there that we cannot do without. Put another way, you want to cripple somebody, you want to cripple somebody or hurt them. Just mess with DNS availability. How many of you run your own DNS at home? Anyone? Does anyone have their own DNS machine at home? For your personal use, for your home network? Hello? I'm hearing crickets. Has anyone thought of implementing your own personal DNS in your home? Nobody? Not really. Not really. Well, that's a candid response and an honest one. And I thank you for responding, right? I want you to start thinking right here and now in the present at this moment. I think before the end of our Labor Day weekend, you're going to be using your own DNS in your own home network. That's what I think. Based on what you're about to see and witness when you get home after Friday's class. OK, so the interesting thing about this course is that we're going to be getting onto the forensic side of the nuclear the uh, nuclear, the network environment. Sorry, that was a slip. I'm sitting in my office in front of my plants missile launch platform. And so I just had a brain skip there. Your network environment, right? And um, network addresses and host names. The simple truth is your availability 
critically depends upon the instant rendering of name to address associations. Without it, the flow of your digital information grinds to a halt or it slows. So whenever the internet service provider, their DNS servers are slow or worse, local internet service providers use other open source internet DNS machines. <gasps> no, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, they would. Uh, they would as a backup and sometimes their own DNS machines are in a state of, I don't know, update or maintenance or they're there, they're not there. What does that do? Well, it slows down your internet because everybody has to use the same clunker and, or it stops your internet altogether. Question, in any given week, can you ever think of any given week where you did not experience at least one slow down or halt of your network service? Hello? Um, that's an honest question. And that's, that's where we're going to leave this class. I want you to ask yourself, can you think of a week where your network service wasn't down or just plain slow? Is there a week where everything was fine? Now, if the answer to that question is yes, I've had, uh, Appropriate service, smooth, fast, and hot. And I've gone weeks without having that problem. So let's change the question. Can you think of at least one or two weeks in a given month where you had slow or disrupted service? If the, where you did not have, if the answer to that question is yes, I want you to open up an email screen and I want you to email the name of your internet service provider and where you live. And I'm not making this up. Because I want to continue the discussion on Friday when we get hands on. Okay. So you're saying to send you an email? Yes. Send me an email where you share uh, in a in a given month. I I can't think of more than one week. A given week, more than one week in a given month where my internet service was slow or it wasn't working. And tell me who your internet service provider is and tell me where you live geographically, okay? You don't have to give me your physical address. Just tell me the general area of the island where you, you reside. And, and then we'll pick it up from there on Friday. Are there any questions before we clear for the day? That last paragraph, once he had his host names and addresses, he could figure out what programs may be listening on the ports that were open at those addresses. That's the very thing we're doing for the first tasks in our solution, right? We want to get an adversaries, an adversarial view of our own home network. That's what we want. We want to get a glimpse of what a hacker is going to see when they try to get on your home network. Okay, to be continued. I'm going to stop recording and stop sharing. <laughs>